Support for Fieldwork is provided by Manitou Fund. Fake clapper, pen drop, ready, and... Hey, everyone. This is Fieldwork. My name is Mitchell Hora. I'm a farmer from Iowa. And I, of course, am Zach Johnson, and I farm in Minnesota. Do we want to actually roll with this, or are we going to oh, start from yeah. the top again? We're going to roll yeah, with it. We're You're not going to let me back out of that. We are into it. There is no turning back. Okay. No editing allowed. Okay. Well, this is the podcast where we talk about what is working, what is not, in sustainable agriculture. Well, that's what the script says, but usually we just kind of talk about all kinds of random stuff. We kind of wing it. We go off the rails. Today, we're going to talk with a fellow podcaster, Tim Hammerich. Tim is a is the host of the Future of Agriculture podcast, where they explore the people, companies, and the ideas shaping the future of agribusiness. Yeah, Tim has multiple different things going on, and uh, with his company and stuff too, he does some recruitment kind of things, and he's really got his finger, you know, on the pulse, the latest innovations in the ag world. Yeah, he's also one of the founders of AgGrad. Um, that is a company that connects job seekers and employers in the agribusiness world. So, uh, yeah, with those two fields of expertise, we really wanted to talk to Tim about what skills that people are going to need on the farm in the next 5, 10, 20 years, you know, as a data really becomes more of a piece of the equation. Yep, yep. The farming industry is always changing like anything else. Um, if you want to get a premium price for using conservation practices, you got to do all sorts of data tracking, things that really didn't used to be a part of the farmer's skill set. I mean, now the game's being changed. Yeah. No, totally being changed and, and moving into more management and less day-to-day consistent labor. Yeah. And uh, so let's dig into it. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for jumping on here today. Glad to have you. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Big big fans of you both. Basically, we have kind of open-ended talk that we can have here for a little bit on the future of agriculture. Um, obviously, you do a lot of stuff with, with younger folks in agriculture as well. Sounds great. No, I, I got my start, uh, started in 2016. I, I started a recruitment company six months before and realized that in order to do recruitment, you need like companies who know you do recruitment to hire you and you need people to recruit. And uh, I had neither. So I, I decided I wanted to start a podcast uh, about ag innovation because that's what I was interested in. And sort of that's where the origins became. I thought it would be a good marketing tool. Turns out it wasn't a good marketing tool at all, but uh, it was fun to do. So I kept at it and, and have released new episode every week ever since. Oh, I know you you interview a lot of these new like ag tech companies and stuff too on your podcast, Tim. Tell us a little bit more about that and um, how you view where these tech companies are going. Like, Give us some highlights of some companies that you've highlighted on your podcast. Sure. The thesis of the show is, is you know, it's, it's called Future of Agriculture. So it's, you know, I, I think there's a really interesting quote uh, that, that basically says the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So, you know, we can get a good glimpse of what the future of agriculture is going to look like when we see small glimpses of it, you know, through through examples. And in one company we had on the show two years ago, uh, to give you a good sense of this, was Nori. And Nori is, you know, created a blockchain-enabled marketplace for carbon sequestration credit to pay farmers to sequester carbon. Now, that was two years ago, and I thought that concept blew my mind. And now today, it's like, okay, yeah, a lot of people are trying to do that. We hear about it all the time. It's almost becoming, you know, ubiquitous. And so I think that's, you know, that's sort of the crux of the show is how can we find something that's on the fringes today, but two years later might be a big part of the, a central part of the conversation. It is funny how quickly that can move. Like, when you say that out loud, it makes me think, you know, yeah, two years ago is when you kind of think this is some sort of a pipe dream. Yeah. And now it's, it, it's real. Like, it's real. It's interesting to see. I mean, you know, we're not putting that into into play on my farm, you know, but Mitchell's working with it every day. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's it's here. We're going to figure it out. It's uh, it is crazy just how fast that moves. So what do you see as far as skills that you think are becoming increasingly important on the farms? Yeah, I think that's been an interesting development that that uh, has happened over the course of doing the podcast. As I brought on farmers, obviously, you guys talk about data a lot on this on this podcast, and sometimes it gets a bad rep because you know data sort of is a mysterious way of saying information, which is nothing new. But as you know, we've been collecting more and more data on the farm. One thing I've seen is that uh, farmers are telling me they're thinking about hiring someone and calling them a data manager. That kind of started coming out this past year, and I've heard it three or four times since, which is we need someone to aggregate 
uh, agronomic data as well as economic data and keep it organized and useful for us so that we can do something with it. I'm glad that my uh, love for data has infiltrated all aspects of, of the podcast here. That's good. It's like all from machine. you, Mitchell. I yeah, like just, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if the just, data just becomes self-aware? Edging it in there. Oh, it's definitely becoming self-aware. That's that's These high data level. Science, I think the data manager guy is talking about total robots. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely going to be robots. I will say, Zach, I think you are way too worried about the data becoming self-aware. And, and tell us more about tell that. Tell us more. How does yeah. that make you feel? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you've tried some, you know, AI tools as they as they stand currently, you know, we still got a long way to go. For example, just just trying to get a software that will transcribe these podcasts down into text. Mm. Every, you know, every time it does, it's, it thinks my name is Tim Hemorrhage for starters. I think we've got a long ways to go before the the AI becomes self aware. Zach, are we not talking about artificial insemination here? I'm a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Different AI. Well, I. Probably a ways before that becomes self-aware as well. (laughs) Probably. Probably. Well, but to make a clarification, though, you're talking AI as in artificial intelligence and utilizing this big data to help help us, like, make better decisions. And, yeah, we have a ton of data of information. That was a good point that you made there, Tim. We have a ton of information, but it's how do we actually use the information – to help us to drive a better decision and improve upon our operations. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of farmers are farmers because they like the actual farming part. They like growing things and they want the insights from the data. But to sit there and mess with the data on a day in, day out basis, you know, Mitchell, that may be something you really enjoy. But Zach, I bet it's probably something you don't. No, I no. don't enjoy it either, actually. That's why we built a software. <laughs> so then it does it for me. That's exactly it. Fact. Even yeah. better. Fact. Yeah. Uh, sometimes... I'm of the belief that oftentimes there's there's too much data out there. I mean, we have to figure out what's useful and what's not. And a lot of it seems like, okay, that's really fun and really cool, and I'm glad I know that, but now how do I use it? Right, and that takes a whole different skill set. You know, I, I think using those tools, like Mitchell mentioned, takes a whole different skill set. So this ability to understand how to fully utilize the tool and how to extract what actually is important from the information uh, is a skill set we haven't maybe had at the farm level in the past. How important do you think that's going to be, Tim, especially tied back to, like, sustainability? Yeah, I mean, you all have done a great job of covering it on the show through through previous episodes, but uh, essentially a, a word like sustainability and, and other words that may go along with it, like regenerative, uh, even organic, they're going to need to mean something. When I say mean something, I don't mean a Webster's definition. I mean, they're going to have to be backed by data that says, okay, I am regenerative, and that's different from me not being regenerative because of this data. And so in order to be able to say that, you've got to first collect the data, then you have to have it organized in a way that shows the difference between I am regenerative or I am sustainable and I'm not. And so how can the farmers develop these skills in order to, you know, go about deciding what is good data and what is not? Yeah, that is a big question. <laughs> I don't know the answer is, is the short version of, of my response to that. But I think it's a process. You know, we've got a lot of interesting companies out there in ag tech, and that's what we tend to focus on on our show is sort of what problem are these ag tech companies solving and how. So I think it's going to be an evolution that happens between companies developing these tools and the farmers utilizing them and making sure that we're actually solving real pain points and real problems. Um, I thought your episode with General Mills in the first season was really interesting to talk about, you know, kind of how they want to use the data uh, from from a customer facing standpoint, consumer facing standpoint, but we still need, you know, the farmer to kind of understand how it helps them. Where, how does it translate back to their bottom line? And so, trying to get all of these groups together—the food companies, the consumers, the ag tech companies, and of course the farmer at the middle of it all—to uh, see how everything's mutual benef- mutually beneficial. It's it's going to take some time. Yeah, no, that's totally right. And I think a good point there, too, on aligns with my view that the data can be really important for these supply chain opportunities was is what I call them, like whether it be with a con- consumer facing company like General Mills or with like an ecosystem market or, you know, carbon market kind of stuff. It's yeah, hopefully the, the data can be utilized there to help us to be more profitable. But it has to make sense today as well. And that's that is where ag tech and more actionable data really plays a part. Yeah, 100% agree. Great conversation here, and there is a lot more to cover, but right now it's time to take a quick break. We'll be right back, continuing our conversation with Tim Hamrich.
Welcome back to the Fieldwork Podcast. I'm Zach Johnson. I'm Mitchell Horror. We're talking today with Tim Hamrich. When you look ahead to the future here, Tim, what do you think is going to change when it comes to hiring people and the labor force on the farms? Do you think farmers are going to have to look differently about the people that they hire and the skill sets that those people are going to have to possess? Yeah, I, th- I think we're already seeing that in terms of how difficult it is to find good people. You know, one one storyline that maybe we don't talk about enough is when we talk about the, the common story that we're approaching now, 1% of our population involved in production agriculture. Well, 30 years ago, when that was a little, maybe a little bit higher, there were more farm kids, quote unquote, where, you know, if you were a farmer, you could find another farm kid to come work for you. Well, with consolidation with fewer and fewer people involved, number one, the farms that are still around are, are big enough that maybe they could support the kid coming coming back and working on the farm. And number two, there's just fewer of them. And so I I think we're already seeing the pinch of we can't recruit the people we used to recruit and we can't find the people that maybe we did uh, in our parents' generation or before. And and I think the way that needs to change is is a couple reasons, a couple ways. Number one, uh, I think younger folks like us, and I'm putting the three of us in the same category, although I think I'm a little bit older than you two, but uh, younger folks like us, we don't just want uh, a job in general. We want a career path. So we want to see, like, where does this lead? How am I going to learn? How am I going to grow? How am I going to be a better person in five years because I went to work here? That wasn't a conversation that was ha- you know people were having much you know before, but now it's an important part if you want to attract and retain the right type of people. Well, I think something that's really interesting now, too, that was Something that kind of struck me in talking with um, with some guys is some of the folks that did not grow up on the farm but are entering the workforce and they want to have like a purpose in life. They're not going into a job only to make money or only as a means to an end or only because they enjoy it, but they want a bigger purpose. How has that kind of tied in with uh, the your view on recruiting into ag? Yeah, it's it's a big deal. I mean, look at the three of us. The jobs that we have, and I know you two both are farmers, but also, you know, Mit- Mitchell with what you're doing with Continuum Ag, and Zach, what you're doing with, with Millennial Farmer, like these, first of all, are, are probably jobs that wouldn't have existed uh, 10, 20 years ago. But second of all, they're jobs that we're doing because we, we like the bigger purpose. I, I don't want to speak for you guys, but in general, like you could probably get a good, comfortable living doing something else, but it wouldn't fulfill you in the way that this work does. And that, that goes to same for me. You know, I, I spent the first eight years of my career trading commodities, so buying and selling grain and feed ingredients. And, uh, you know, it was a fun job, but I didn't really feel fulfilled at the end of the day. But now that I'm, you know, recruiting full time with AgGrad and then doing this Future of Agriculture podcast, the income is more volatile, but the fulfillment is really important. And, and we're not I, I know you guys, I, we're special, don't get me wrong, but we're not that special. Most people our age kind of want something similar, and uh, employers, if they want to attract and retain top talent, need to uh, cater to that a little bit. Yeah, that that's an awesome way to put that. I mean, I think that that really is key, right? I mean, like you say, we're passionate about what we do. We enjoy what we do, and maybe it's not not always the most profitable or whatever it may be, but but it's something that we love doing. Um, and then you did say we're not special. I just want to remind you that Mitchell definitely is. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I was also thinking, too, since before, like, yeah, YouTube, well, for, like, Zach's stuff with Millennial Farmer, YouTube wasn't around 20 years ago. But Zach had a, right. his Telegram page was blowing up yes, well before. my Telegram blog. <laughs> My, I had a Morse code blog. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Would, well, if, do they have Morse code influencers? I could, yeah, I could. Is that like a thing? Wake up and Morse code and send out little telegraphs to the, um, <laughs> you know, the railroad workers. <laughs> <laughs> Going out to uh, check the cows this morning. <laughs> send, <laughs> send. <laughs> then come back. I'm back. Yeah. Send. <laughs> All right, Tim. Uh, so. From the beginning of of your podcast, uh, I want to know: Are there any big moments for you? Are there any aha moments or any anything that stands out to you as far as where it changed for you, where something jumped out at you, and and you really ended up with a story out of that? There's a lot of examples. I think one recently I, I've really been into is the idea of open source ag tech. So there are these. Uh, entrepreneurs out there that create a product, but but have the product, you know, let's say it's a software, completely open for whoever wants to take it, use it, do whatever they want with it, improve it. Uh, so their business is not the product itself, but their business may be ancillary to the product. So, you know, one example is uh, a guy I just interviewed. I actually haven't released the, the episode yet, but he's got a... Um, 
a software called Farm OS, and it's a farm management operating system that he just puts it out there to the world. Whoever wants to use it can, and then he sells services in addition to that. So you can host it with him, or he'll help you troubleshoot it and provide like customer success. And I thought from an ag tech perspective, that's such an interesting model and so different than what we often hear, which is, you know, go raise a bunch of money and try to blow this thing up to as big as you can so you could sell it and make everybody rich. I just think it's an interesting spin. And I think we'll see more and more farmers that become technologically savvy do things like this because farmers have been hackers on their own farm forever. And so sharing ideas and trying new things, I could see that translating to technology. And that's just a storyline I'm going to follow a lot more this year and one I'm really excited about. Yeah, I heard of Farm OS like a while ago, but I haven't really heard a lot of updates on exactly what they're doing. So that's cool that they're, you know, sharing in that, being open. And I think farmers, you know, inherently are a lot more open to sharing, working as a community, working with each other. And especially in times like now, you know, where we do need to really be smart, we need to figure out how to be more profitable, that we do need to work together. We need to be able to be open and utilizing technology to do that is awesome. So. Yeah, I think so, too. And, and and another thing on that, too, and this is different from open source, but another guess that sort of opened my eyes is some of these uh, farmers that are trying to go direct to consumer, not with a lot of their, you know, they're not shifting all their corn acres to like, you know, pinto beans and selling them at the farmer's market. They're trying just with a small percentage of their operation and going closer to the consumer to capture more of that value. And in turn, what they're doing is, you know, building a brand and kind of building some momentum to be a little bit more in control of their own destiny. And I think that's an interesting story to follow for the the future of agriculture as well. What's been your best interview besides us? Yeah, second. Well, best. so yeah, this is th- <laughs> this yeah. is definitely the best. <laughs> this this ranks up there for sure. Um, boy, I tell you what, I I an interview last year that was probably my best and it really opened my eyes with a guy named Dr. David Zetlin, who's a water economist. And the first question I asked was, you know, oh, you hear a lot about depleting groundwater and you hear a lot about, you know, climate change and how how much should we worry about water? And there was kind of a brief pause and he said, "Well, we should be panicking." And I went, "Oh, Okay, and then and then the whole rest of the interview basically supported that argument, and uh, it really opened my eyes to how much we're not talking about water. Because I know up in you know Minnesota, you're 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 trying to put in drainage tile, you're, you have too much water. But in a lot of producing areas, especially areas where uh, we produce specialty crops that can't be grown everywhere, such as California, we've got some major issues. And, and so I think that not only was probably my best interview, uh, but one that opened my eyes the most. That's a pretty big powerful bold statement yeah. to start off an interview with yeah so did did that yes. i mean did you said that that interview kind of backed up that claim i mean i assume that guy probably was a pretty good interview he was able to really get his point across that was probably a fun one it was so he has a yeah phd in, in um resource economics with a focus in water he's been working uh it, both in california as well as he lives in amsterdam so he's been working in europe as well and so he had a really global view and uh really sort of a, a, a data driven view on look you know we're we're pumping this groundwater dry because uh you know in climate change, what you have is, is weather volatility, right? So in dry years, when you can't get the rainfall, you're pumping groundwater. And that's what a lot of farmers are doing, because how else are you going to keep trees alive that, you know, to stay in production? And so what we're doing is depleting our groundwater. And you're just seeing this year, actually, California putting it into place something called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA. And so that's something a lot of the, the other uh, Western states ought to be looking at, because it's the first sort of statewide regulation of groundwater and how much and how they get pumped out. Yeah, cause for Zach's farm and my farm, it's too much rain at certain times of the year and not enough rain in other times of the year. It's, you know, we have plenty of rain in total, but it's just the timing of it can kind of be a little bit off and, you know, utilizing better technology to be able to manage that is key. And we're trying to figure out, you know, just infiltrating and holding more of that water, of course, in the field too is super important. And I don't know. I think that's where the whole sustainability soil health thing really ties in, that it's going to solve, it can help to solve a lot of different problems, you know, around not enough water, too much water, water quality. You know, there's a lot of things that that are really important. And I know there's a lot of technology coming to kind of help to manage that as well, especially like sensors or other remote sensing kind of stuff. What's your view on some of that? 
I think it's a great start. You know, I really believe in technology enabling other technologies. On the surface level, though, a sensor is not going to do any good if you can't get the water there. Like if you just, you know, if you can't get the water there, no amount of sensor is really going to be helpful. Uh, so you have to have a way of executing on that data, you know, a theme that I'm sure has come up a lot on, on this show. Um, but but I think another thing is, and, and I think about this a lot in terms of soil health, you've got these specialty crops, let's say onions and carrots, where you don't really want too much moisture up in that root zone because it will rot your crop crop. And so you obviously, you plant that on sandier soils, but so how, how do you balance that with soil health uh, when you've got a root crop or when you've got a tree crop that the harvest literally falls on the ground and gets picked up? So you want the ground really clear. Um, so it, it, there are a lot of complicated elements to to soil health. And, and um, I, I know it's complicated enough just in the Midwest, but when you start throwing in some of these specialty crops, it gets really complicated. But I think with so much of this too, and in my view and in... I think we do a, a good job of the angle on the field or podcast here too, that it's not a one size fits all. Like there's a lot of those situations where they don't necessarily want to get a bunch of organic matter built up or they don't want to get cover crops and have this coverage all the time, but it's okay. Let's use something else then. let's do something different. That's still going to help us to solve the ending problem, which is the focus has to just be on, What's that carbon impact and getting carbon into the soil, or at least just not releasing more carbon into the atmosphere and feeding into the problem, improve water quality, improve the water use, use efficiency and create healthy food. Like the, I think we have to maintain the focus on what is the actual outcome that we want, not only on, you know, the specific symptoms or the individual pieces of it, but at that big picture level. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think a lot of people are trying to push the conversation to that end. It just gets a lot more complicated. And so it's a little harder. You know, it's easier to say, oh, yeah, cover crops and bring livestock back to the land and uh, reduce tillage and, and have that equal regenerative agriculture. Uh, it's a little more complicated when you start talking on the outcomes because you need you know the, that data piece that we talked about earlier on. Tim, what do you think some of the most important skill sets will be for farmers as we go forward into the next 10, 20, 40 years? From what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from people that I talk to, the skill sets have to mirror those more of, of an executive. So you think about the size of operation that some of these farmers are, are operating and the fact that, you know, they're expected to uh, take over the reins um, from from their previous generations sort of as kind of working their way up. And that's great. But I think also some maybe more executive type ed education. If it were if we're in the business world, you know, you'd have like your MBA types, you know, taking over. Obviously, that's not the case in farming because there's a whole lot more than just you know just the business school that goes into it. But I think starting to think like an executive, uh, attract the right people to make data driven decisions, um, and really leading a team. I think those are the mindsets that are going to serve people well. So you think as we move forward, the, the actual management decisions of the farm and working smarter and not always just harder is going to becoming increasingly more important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talking today with Tim Hamrich. He uh, has all kinds of stuff going on. The future of ag, ag grad, talking about recruiting, talking about data and the needs of farmers in the future. Thanks, Tim. Have right, a good yeah. one. Thank you, Tim. Oh, my pleasure. It's now that time on the Fieldwork Podcast when we take listener voicemails. Hey, it's Isaac Harris here from Southwest Minnesota, and I work and manage a very small family farm type thing. At this point, it's hard to see the impacts that a small family farm that I am managing right now is making much of a difference. So my question type thing is, is there much hope for small family farms in the future? And what, as a small farm, can I do to better practice the agriculture? Thanks. Bye. Isaac, first off, thank you very much for calling in. We appreciate that. It's great to hear from everybody who calls into this show. You know, I get this question quite a bit on my social media, people wondering about small family farms and what's the future of farming and, and where do we go from here? And I've always had the same answer. I, I really believe... The small farms, the small family farms in particular here, um, in a lot of ways actually have an advantage over some of the bigger farms because you you have the ability to be a little bit more flexible on your farm, um, I believe, and, and you also have the ability to really cater to some of the niche markets that are out there now that the consumers are demanding, you know, that we didn't see 5, 10, 20 years ago. And so I think, 
if you can find a way to cater to some of those markets, especially if you're anywhere near a large population where there's a, a high volume of consumers, if you can find a way to cater to one of those markets, uh, I really think you're you're actually at an advantage. And you don't have to be a big farm to be profitable. And you certainly don't have to be a big farm to love what it is you do. Uh, there's a lot of small farms out there where, where farming is not their main job. It is a second source of income. It's something they love to do. And that's that's awesome. You know, I hope that those farms never go away. And I really don't believe that they ever will. Um, but these niche markets, you know, whether it's direct to consumer or direct to restaurant or uh, maybe a CSA type of thing or, or providing food trucks with something specific, you know, whatever it might be. There's a lot of really cool, unique niche markets out there that have popped up that people are taking advantage of that I think you you may, by the sounds of it, may be in position to look at and capitalize on. Maybe it's something with uh, organic or sustainability or or um, growing your own livestock and selling direct to consumers and, and providing all the feed for your own livestock and your own fertilizer. Um, these are just some ideas that I'm throwing out there. You know, these, these are not things that I have personal experience with, and I admit that, but Man, I just think there are opportunities out there now, probably as many as there has been in a long, long time. So I wish you the best of luck. Uh, it's great to hear from you. No, I definitely don't think the small family farms uh, are going away. I think there is a place for them in the future for sure. So we appreciate you calling in again. It's great to hear from you, Isaac. Thank you very much. That's it for Fieldwork today. Thanks to all the people who helped make Fieldwork possible. Annie Baxter, Amy Scotchless cole Claire Jones, Noah Boston, Kristen Schmidt, Eric Romani, and Lauren Humper. Our theme song is written and performed by Johnny Vince Evans with help from Corey Shreppel. And our website is fieldworktalk.org, and we are Fieldwork Talk on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you like our show, it'd be awesome if you write us a review. Hit us up. We've got a call-in number as well where uh, you can call in and leave us a voicemail. Yeah, we'd love to get a voicemail from you out there. If you got anything to say, you can call into the show, leave us a comment or a question, 651-228-4810. That is, again, 651-228-4810. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tune in next time for more exciting content from the Fieldwork Podcast. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> <laughs>